But what they're telling you here is that through the measurement, uh, typically a boiler works its best when it's at about 75% of its rated value. That's when they're, they're most efficient. Again, exceptions. The high uh, recovery, uh, what do they call them, uh, combustion, condensing boilers are the opposite. Their, their, their efficiency is at the very low end. That's the way they work. But, so, you, you need me for, okay. Uh, so, so that I'm not dealing with that, so that the, what I'm dealing with is a typical boiler. Typically at 75% and everything adjusted, you're going to get efficiency out of it when your oxygen, what you want to do here, and, and just bear this in mind, is you want the lowest possible oxygen to go up the stack. Because let's say if you were able to theoretically use all of the oxygen that was available, 21% of it, and you blended it with the right amount of fuel, then the only byproduct would be carbon dioxide. We can't get it that efficient. It's almost impossible because there are so many, remember 123 chemical reactions going on in this burner, we can't produce that at this point in time. We don't have the technology to, but we're getting much closer to it. These are again examples of where you would see this. If you look over here on their left, you'll see that the CO2 is at 6%. CO2 is the byproduct of combining these two. What you want to see is a CO2 rating that's, that's very high. Uh, the oxygen should be very low. We want to use up the oxygen for combustion. Remember, that's part of the triangle. We've got to have oxygen, we've got to have fuel, we've got to have ignition. So if we've got 10% of oxygen left over going up the stack, you're wasting money. You're wasting fuel. What we want to see is down here in this best setting right there where we've got oxygen at about 3% and CO2 at about 10%. If you get down here, yes, you've got a very high CO2 showing that you're almost using it up. Theoretically, 14% would be perfect if you had 14% CO2 coming out. You can't. But the problem is there's no burner boiler efficiency made that will meet this criteria. So what you wind up doing is you wind up building byproducts. And those byproducts are nitrous oxide and various other things. That, oh, sorry. What did I do here? Hit the wrong button. NOx emissions. Oxides of nitrogen are, are byproducts of this thing. Uh, they're dependent on the equipment, the process. And you have two ways of getting it. Thermal knocks, which is from heating the air, like we're doing, like we're talking about doing it. And we're also doing it through the fuel. If your fuel's got bad, if you got bad fuel, there's not a hell of a lot you can do about it. And, and sometimes that's the case. I want you to read that if, at your convenience, but uh, it's, it, it just continues to do it. Here's where, part of where I want to get to today before we get done. Uh, knocks reduction methods. When, when I talk about the big boiler, the big plant, the powerhouse plant, Flue gas scrubbing. I don't know if you guys have ever worked on one, but the other large component in a powerhouse that you see out there to the side of it is the scrubber. The flame goes all the way to the top, six, eight stories, and then it's pulled back down and through a device that cleans the exhaust air, the scrubber. The scrubber cleans the exhaust air and takes out some of these impurities and washes them down the drain or puts them in the Missouri River, as the case may be. But <laughs> they flue gas scrub. That's what, that's, that's what they're talking about here. You can increase the excess air. In other words, when you're burning in a, in, a, in a boiler, in a device, any kind of appliance, if you will, that's burning, you're going to introduce air. You have to introduce air. It's one of the three components of combustion, right? So we introduce the air. You can put in a little more air than is necessary, and that reduces some of the knocks. You have to be careful, because otherwise you're going to put in too much air. Then you can quench the flame, cool the flame, and get thermal knocks. So you have to worry about it. But it, that's why we have these high dollar back rack different devices that, that check all that. The other way, and, and this is where I'm going with this, so you guys are kind of on board with it, is, is flue gas recirculation. I don't know how many of your gearheads, but back in the 70s, in order to meet uh, EPA standards, the federal government mandated that tailpipe emissions be such and such. So what they did uh, back then is they, they actually put a device on the engine called a smog pump. And all it did was it took some of the gas going out of the exhaust and recirculated it back into the intake to reburn it again. Uh, it produced the end result they were looking for, but it wasn't really a very efficient way of doing it and it had its own inherent set of problems.
Flue gas recirculation is, is an up and coming thing. It's been used in Europe for quite a while. They, they tie into the stack and they bring a portion of the stack gases back and reintroduce them. Two things occur. One, it's already heated, so you don't have to add that much heat to it. And two, you help reburn any of those processes that are left there. The burner design is extremely important on, on how to, to make these things work. We, for years, I know anybody that's been around this for very long has seen an old boiler with an old ray burner on it. A ray burner was just a big old hunk of fan that's hung out there. Very inefficient, but it was the first step in the many steps that we took. And although a ray burner was a good burner, it wasn't a very well designed for a combustion mixture process point of view. So we've gone more and more and more to how the combustion head itself is, is designed. I have to be honest about this. In the United States, we have kind of lagged behind every place else in the world uh, because it hasn't been a requirement. It's always driven. I mean, it's no different than the fuel economy we see today. We see economy today because it's driven by the force of money. The same thing's going to occur in your lives here in the future. You're going to see more efficient burners come out. They not only save you fuel, but they also produce a better end result. Okay, we're about to the end of this thing here, but I want to, I want to tell you a couple of things that, that we're doing here. One of the things about efficiency, because burner heads themselves in America aren't that efficient. Uh, there's a company out of Germany, uh, as an example, I'll, I'll use it, uh, Weissop is their name. And, and Weissop has an unbelievable burner design. That's all they do. They don't design boilers, they build burners. And they have about 70% of the world market in burners. So they are very, very adept at doing their job. However, they are very, very expensive. So when you're looking at it, you have to weigh the cost effectiveness with the cost of, of what we're buying on the front end and how long is this going to last. So I'm not pushing YSOP, I'm just using them as an example. Since we cannot and do not produce burners of that nature, what we're trying to do nowadays is we're going to another type of thing that YSOP has engineered many years ago. If you guys have boilers and you look at any of your fire boilers, you've got linkages, right? Everybody's got linkages. Linkages, they've got a, one motor that's, that's opening the gas valve and it's connected with a linkage to the damper and it's connected to a blower and, you know, these linkages are going everywhere. Not a bad idea, but it's kind of like a ray burner. It's passe. It's past its time. YSOP came up with the idea years ago of putting what they call servo motors. But every individual component has its own direct connection. It is not dependent on linkages. So in that case, we get away from that. We get away from that linkage, uh, the loss of efficiency in these linkages. So they've come up with a hell of an idea on it, and it's being copied pretty much everywhere, you know, the way it goes around. And what I was going to tell you about is I think we've got some information. If we don't, we'll get some for you, uh, Val. Com we've got here Honeywell, and again, I'm not selling anybody's product. I don't rep them, and I don't care. But they happen to have a pretty good product here. This, this control links system, what you do is you get away from the linkages that are inherently weak and that cause problems and you can't hardly, you can adjust a boiler till you're blue in the face and there's a certain amount of it you cannot take out of it because of the design of the burner. So if you go with something like this where you've got an individual motor that controls everything in conjunction with one another to a central processor, just like we use on everything, then that processor can evaluate that information and open or close those things as needed to maintain a much better burn for a longer period. Once set up, this, the only thing I would tell you is that, that this particular type of a system is not what I would call real time. It does not measure always continuously the flue gas analysis out your stack. There are companies that can and will do that. They cost a lot of money. But once you set this up with the Honeywell setup, you pretty much leave it alone. You come back and check it again sometime through the year just to double check it. And it's a good idea to check it every year. But you, you just set it up and it takes away a lot of the problems that we inherently had in service calls. I don't know how many service calls I went on that were directly related to linkage breakage, linkage hang up, motor failure, uh, any one of a number of things. Now, it's not to say you won't have problems with this, but it reduces the exposure to those problems is what it does. It reduces the exposure to them. We've put it in in several places, I think, Bill, haven't we? I mean, and fairly successfully. I think, I think customers are relatively happy with it, aren't they? Saves you about 8% on your gas bill. I think that's what they've said. I, I think it's, it's really designed for something, what, over $6 million or something like that? There's a number that's used. 
and it isn't Honeywell's number, by the way, it's a standard number, but anything over a, a, like a 6 million BTU boiler could benefit from something of this nature. And again, I'm not selling you run out and buy Honeywell stuff today or buy stock in Honeywell because it's a competitive world here in America and somebody else will come up with the same thing, possibly better, maybe cheaper. I don't know. I'm trying to make you aware that there are alternatives that are on the doorstep and they're going to come. And they're going to be driven by a couple of things. One, fuel cost. Two, government intervention. And they're going to be looking at things like this Knox because when I traveled around and did a lot of work, I did a lot of work at a lot of different places all over the United States. And every one of them had some issue with the flue gas analysis. Every one of them, that's why we were there, to resolve some form of flue gas issue. So it's important that we pay attention to what these are because it's going to come. Whether we want it to or not, we may as well embrace it and move forward with it. It's better for all of us. I'm winding down with all this. I don't know how we're doing on time, okay. Any questions at this point? Yes, sir. Yes, Greg. David, a couple of observations and great presentation. Thank you. Uh, I have been in many boiler rooms where motion air louvers have been blocked off with uh, cardboard or other materials, and we've helped more than one client replace a boiler because it was starved for oxygen. Sure. And uh, I, you know, I want to emphasize that that's something that people need to look at. Do not starve your boiler of oxygen. It's, it's, one of the most, it's one of those three components, fuel, right. air, and spark. That's what's what it takes, and it takes the right combination. And if, if an engineer designed this, I have the trust that the engineer calculated that it needs so many square feet of open space uh, to, to allow that oxygen to get in there. And if you block any of that, then what you're doing is you're reducing uh, the amount of oxygen that's available for combustion. Will it combust? Yes, but it will be incomplete combustion and it'll soot up the inside of the boiler, it'll create a lot of different problems for you. So if there's a problem, and I understand why they get blocked, Greg, why, why would people block these off 90% of the time? Room is cold. There you go. It's, it's, to, it's to save the water heater in there or the, or the lines or something in there. And, and I understand why, it makes perfect sense why. But what we need to do is look at it from a larger viewpoint. Yes, if you have to block something temporarily, but give it some other source of air if you have to do that, if you can, open a door that allows it to come in. Now, a boiler inspector would, would shoot me on site for telling you to open a boiler door that, that should be closed. I agree. So the idea here is to look into the reason what's causing this problem and fix that. Because always, all we're doing is just putting Band-Aids on it. And you can put a Band-Aid on a gushing wound, but you're still going to bleed to death. It's just a matter of how long. Another observation I had too uh, was the quality of the combustion air. And just to give you an example, we replaced the boiler, helped a client with this boiler at Health Club. They set the boiler in the same room with the filters for the swimming pool. Well, basically, the chlorine ate their boiler up. To yes, days. yes. So, uh, very often, you're better off putting in a uh, sealed combustion chamber boiler when you have situations like that. Yes. The boiler, should, the, boiler uh, the observation of the boiler should really be adapted to the use and where it's got to sit. Uh, in Kansas City here for many, many years, we had a lot of, of uh, film processing and printers and lithographers, uh, basically due, I suppose, to Hallmark and its proximity. Uh, but those processors put out a lot of fumes, and those fumes would eat up evaporator coils almost in a season. You know, you, you could put them in. So we coated them and put them in, and that retarded it, but it's almost impossible to retard every action that's going to occur. So you can slow it down, but you can't stop it. But you do need to apply it to its correct uh, position and, and application. I mean, things need to be looked at in, in a larger aspect. Any questions? Anything I can answer? Everybody happy? Val, you got something? No, we're good. Okay. You Thank you, Dave, and thank everybody else. We can give Dave a hand. Oh, appreciate it.